Good morning everybody, Victor here. We got a beautiful day in South Florida. If you guys are new to the channel, welcome aboard. Good morning. Captain Brookie at the wheel. So today's game plan, we're gonna head out of Hillsborough Inlet, our home inlet. We're fishing with the world's most expensive bait fish today, the goggle eye. We're gonna try to see how many different species we can catch on this bait, hopefully catch some dinner. You guys are coming along, we'll see you out there. Beautiful day out here, guys. Just ran out of Hillsborough Inlet. A little choppy out here. So I told you we're fishing with the world's most expensive bait fish today, and I was not lying. So this right here is a goggle eye. My good friend Brian Fangler got us some goggle eyes the other day. So this bait fish right here goes around now with inflation, right around $120 a dozen. So that is $10 a fish. Woo! If you don't cast your bait out, they want to stay by the boat, so i got to get them out there. So as I'm letting them out, the reason they're so expensive is because the bait guys who fish for them, they got to go out at night. No one wants to be out there at 2 a.m. It's a very unpredictable bait fishery. Um, a lot of times you go and you don't get them. Yeah, that's why they're expensive. These are not something you can go and cast net or, you know, sabiki during the middle of the day. you got to be out there drifting around in 300, 400 feet of water in the wee hours of the night, and that's why these guys get top dollar for these baits. And we're doing what me and Brooke love to do out here, and that is drift fish, because you never know what you're gonna catch. So there's the goggle eye. You guys see that his real big eyeball, that's a nocturnal fish. They feed primarily at night. During the day, they school up and they hide from predators. These guys do not like to be out and about during the day. So that is $10 I'm holding in my hand right there. So we got one single hook. This is a Mustad Ultra Point Live Bait hook. And then we got a treble hook that I'm gonna put right here on the side of them in case we get something like a kingfish or toothy fish to come by that tries to short strike it. We rig it just like that. Once again, gotta give him some motivation. I'm gonna try to cast him out. So he swims away from the boat. Okay, and then I'm gonna do something different with this guy right here. We have one goggle eye on top and I got this cool little clip right here, which I can release this little mechanism. I'm gonna put this on my line. I just got a three ounce weight on there. So that way when I reel it in, I can just unclip that. But just to get our bait down a little bit deeper, you know, cover the whole water column. So you guys remember a couple weeks ago, I posted that live Speedo, we slow trolled these guys video. Well, we actually froze some because they make great bait. And while we're drifting around, not only are we trying to catch pelagic fish, but it never hurts to put a bait on bottom. You never know, you pick up a snapper, grouper, porgy. Um, so we're gonna go with a bait about, say this big, nice speedo chunk. This is super oily. When you freeze these guys, they just put out this really amazing scent. So you guys see, we got one gog up top, one gog kind of mid column. We're gonna send this bait down. We got brookie jigging. Um, I got a 16 ounce lead right here because it's kind of bumpy out and we want this to stay as vertical as possible. About 20 feet of 40 pound tough line fluorocarbon, 6-0 mustad hook. I'm going to take that speedo chunk, I'm going to hook it right here in kind of that tough part of the speedo, right by the base of the tail. Hopefully this turns into a mutton. Last time we fished out here actually doing this we caught a keeper mutton and the only thing with this is i'm going to let it down nice and slow because if you let it down too fast you're going to whirly bird on the way down and your leader is going to get tangled up on your main line and we want to fish this as close to the bottom as possible feels good to be back out here we haven't done just like our you know standard drift and sesh out of hillsborough in a very long time i feel like wow oh yeah can you zoom in on that do you see the base just got showered so right now there's a frigate bird, that big black bird in the sky. And we see a bunch of baits getting showered. So frigates are always a good sign of pelagics because they usually fall around sailfish or dolphin or tuna. Um, they wait for the fish to push up the bait and then they steal it basically from them up top. So anytime you're next to a frigate, it's always a good sign. So when we see those little bites that you guys see the rod tip, I usually don't 
mess with those. I really, something's either got to pull drag or really double over for me to pick up the rod because that's usually just smaller fish and the rod just doubled over. That's a fish nice. right there. That's a fish. Come on, baby. How's this for a rock, Rook? It's kind of a lot of dead weight, actually. No bites on our goggle eye, but that's why I like to put down a, a bottom bait because even if you catch junk, it just keeps your morale high and you're, at least you're catching fish, you know? You could go all day without putting a pelagic in the boat. And it's just nice to be able to cover the entire water column and not waste any opportunity while you're out here. What? Oh boy. There is a fish though. Yeah, there is. What line even is it on? This? Is that a... It's a grouper. It's a little red grouper. A little red grouper. We got a mess going on here. Okay, so we got ourselves little red grouper, very undersized. These guys got to be 20 inches to keep. This guy's about, I don't know, probably eight inches too short, but a gorgeous little fish. And uh, you know, there could be a keeper down there. You never know, also mutton. But if you find red grouper, you're usually indicative of some pretty good bottom. So we'll send this guy back down on his way. We're gonna vent him real quick. So I just vented him and you guys can hear that air kind of coming out of him. I just poke right here, kind of behind his pectoral fin and get all the air out of him. That way he can descend freely. And uh, if you don't vent him, if you guys don't have one of these little devices and you're catching bottom fish, you let him go, they're gonna end up floating and die. So very important. A little tool like this, they sell so many different kinds. You guys know Vic had to bust out the slow pitch stuff. Um, this is our second drift. No bites on the goggle eye yet. That one red grouper just dropped down a slow pitch jig in 195 feet of water. Feels very small, but like I said, anything to pass the time. And uh, you know, I've had some incredible catches on the slow pitch jig. African pompano, groupers. You never know what's gonna eat it. It is a, oh, it's a mutton. This is actually a really special moment, you know what? This is my first mutton I've ever caught on a slow pitch jig, believe it or not. Really? Really, I swear I've never ever caught a mutton on the slow pitch jig. I know he's no giant, but if a little one's gonna eat it, a keeper can eat it for sure. So, so far it's looking like we're in the uh, bottom fish species. You guys see how stiff this fish looks? Just like the red grouper? We're gonna have to vent him because he's uh, all those gases in him have expanded. It's a process actually called barotrauma here. I'm gonna stick him right down here. So I have this little venting tool right here behind the peg fin. Sometimes you don't get it on the first shot, but you can you can feel it and you can hear it. He doesn't have all those gases pressing on his organs now. Gorgeous little mutton snapper. See that alone, that fish right there will make me want to jig all day long and not get tired. So I'm gonna let this little guy go. All right, so we have moved locations. Now we're going to do our third drift. This time we're starting out in front of, just ahead of a wreck so that we can drift our baits over the wreck. And I'm also gonna jig as we go over the wreck and hopefully we catch something. I got picked up. Really? Yep, something ate it. Come on. Woo! There we go, baby. As I was letting out the goggle eye, I said, Brooke, if we get close to this wreck, it's probably gonna be Barracuda. So let's see if she'll prove me wrong. But as soon as I was letting it out, we've been here not even a minute and we're already on, baby. Feels like a Barracuda. And I said, I, I said, we got three plans today, guys. We're either going to harvest a sailfish or well, two plans, or we're gonna catch a Barracuda. If we could be lucky and catch a wallet, that'd be great too, but. But I think it's a Barracuda because they don't really make like long screaming runs. It's kind of just like more stubborn head shakes, which is exactly what this fish is doing. Whereas a wallet where a king would kind of really scream it on that first run. And a sailfish would be jumping all over the place like crazy. I'm not a betting man, but my money's on a Barracuda. 
It's a barracuda. He's a pretty little guy too. Yeah, perfect size eating fish. But I think we know we could come back here pretty much all day and catch a barracuda if we want to eat it. So I'm going to let this guy go after we get him in the boat. I think people say that bringing him in the boat is the same option. <laughs> I think it is. I'm not trying to unhook him with all this, this stuff, all these hooks hanging around. All right. Okay, here we go. We might have one of these in our cooler later if nothing else shows up to play, but I don't mind catching these guys. We'll let this guy go. You know, it never used to be like this. I've been fishing this wreck for the last 10 years and Barracuda in the state of Florida, actually there used to be no size limit and there used to be no limit as to how many you could consume or harvest. It was 100 pounds or two fish, whichever is greater. That's a unregulated species in Florida. They put a regulation on them and I will tell you what, I have firsthand witnessed these things explode in population, which is a good thing because I think a lot of people just senselessly killed them. We used to come to this wreck and never have this many barracudas around it. It's not swimming right. It feels like it's cut in half, like I'm dragging it through the water really weird. Oh yeah, this guy got messed up. Look at that. Something toothy tried to eat him. Ah, ah, here we go, here we go. This is the goggle eye that we sent down a little bit. I think we got a fish on, yep. This is gonna be our sail right here, watch. Watch. It's gonna be a lazy sailfish. That was a really weird, weird bite. It was just like sitting there with it. That's what makes me think it's a sail because it came up top, but I don't know. Is it a shark? Oh no, don't tell me it's a shark. I think it's a shark. It's a shark. You know, the last three times we fished out here, we've caught a shark. Unfortunately, that guy had both hooks buried way deep in his throat, which should rust out. I've seen a lot worse than fish, so I just went ahead and cut the wire and sent him on his way. Not ideal, but sometimes there's nothing you can do in a situation like that. All right, midday update for you guys. Midday update is it's very slow out here. We've drifted all the way from Hillsborough Inlet. We're about a mile north of Boca Inlet, so I'd say that's like a six mile stretch. Beautiful north current, which is exactly what you want for pelagics, but nothing's eating. So we're in about 160 feet of water and we keep on jigging. We keep on putting baits on bottom. And you know, we've caught a variety of fish. And if all else fails today, I already told Dennis and Brooke, we're gonna go back to the wreck where we know we might be able to get a barracuda and we're gonna do a barracuda catch and cook. All right guys, guess what time it is? We're back to the barracuda wreck. We tried, man, we tried. It's about midday and um, we're gonna try to drop some dogs on the actual wreck, see if there's AJ's around or African Pompano or Grouper or Barracuda we might just get cut off by. But So I also have a bottom rig right here with a 24 ounce lead. And then we just have 80 pound fluorocarbon leader, big circle hook. We're gonna drop this right on top of the wreck. Okay, so there's a lot of current here. So what we're gonna have to do is Brick's gonna keep the boat in gear, headed right into the current to try to keep us as vertical on top of the wreck as possible because we just flew by the actual structure on this past drift. And I don't want them all the way on bottom, but you know, maybe 20, 30 feet up off the bottom to where the fish hang out. Something's trying to eat them. See that? There's something. On the gog. Oh, okay. We decided to wake up right there. I don't think it's gonna be a barracuda. What do you think? I don't know. It feels like, honestly, kind of groupery, but also like a jack of some sort, like an AJ maybe. I love dropping on the wreck. Um, my first ever African pumpkin was on this wreck, me and Brookie, just the two of us. 
on a live god glide doing the exact same thing I'm doing right now. Just dropping it right on top of it. And I'm fishing pretty tight drag because I do not want to give these fish an inch to get me into the structure. It's a huge shipwreck. It's like a 170 foot ship that they sunk a long time ago. Real popular spot for diving as well. I it? caught a cuda on the circle hook on the gog. <laughs> I mean, it's our target species. It's just not what I was expecting to catch on here. Yep. Got like lucky. The same size as that first one. Yep. Ready, Dennis? Man, we got lucky with that. That mouthful of teeth. Woo! Circle hook, perfectly in the corner. Real lucky to get them like that. A lot of times you get cut off if you're not fishing with wire. I know, buddy, I know. But guess what? You're coming home for dinner right there. That's your standard Barracuda. You could keep two per person per day. I'll have the uh, size limit on the screen here. You can keep one, I believe it's above 36 inches, and then one's gotta fall inside the slot limit. Like I was telling you earlier, back in the day they had no size limit, and you could keep 100 pounds or two fish per person, whichever's greater. Real neat looking, and I always gotta show you guys this. They have one tooth at the bottom of their jaw that fits perfectly into the top of their jaw. You see him shutting it, snap, or shutting it perfectly like that. They got sharp teeth, but it's nothing like a uh, kingfish or wahoo. They're kind of more jagged. I feel like these fish really rip to shreds, whereas they don't do like a clean cut like a kingfish would. But a lot of just power behind this head and very delicious. Don't gotta be afraid of eating them. You guys are gonna see when I fillet this thing. It's delicious flaky white meat. All my islanders out there in the Caribbean, I know you guys love this fish. Not every day can be a winner, but you guys can be winners any day of the week. Um, yeah, today was just, you know, not that successful in terms of what we were trying to target, but we got some dinner. And most importantly, as you guys always hear me say, no such thing as trash fish, just trash cooks. And I'm going to prove that to you tonight in the kitchen because barracuda are delicious. But I'm trying to get in the habit. I told these guys, sometimes you got to know when to call it quits. We had a great day out here. We got our fish for dinner. We're gonna go home, clean it up, cook it, and then on to the next adventure tomorrow. And we got a lot of exciting stuff, a lot of trips planned for you guys for this year. And I cannot wait to show it to you. So we'll see you guys back at the dock. One thing most people complain about Barracuda is the stink. And I'm not gonna lie, just sitting here, Dennis, you smell it? It's a stinky fish. I don't know what it is, but I promise you, the inside of the Barracuda, nothing like the outside. I think it has to do with their slime. It's, um, it's not a good smell, I will tell you that. So if you guys have been afraid to eat this fish because of the smell, I do not blame you. But Barracudas are just kind of these crazy, almost mean looking fish. So I'm going to knock off all the slime off of him. We got the 8 inch Dexter Flexible Filet. Going to make a quick work of this guy. And if you guys are looking for the best filet knives in the game, made in the USA for over 100 years, DexterOutdoors.com. Use my code Landshark. They got pretty much every single filet knife for every application you can imagine. They also got scallop knives, clam knives, oyster knives. They got everything. Okay, we're gonna get on the Barracuda's spine now. Just made my initial outline. Now there's another thing that people don't like about Barracuda and that kind of scares them with eating it. And it's something called Cigatera. Cigatera is a toxin that accumulates on certain reefs. It's a tiny, tiny organism and uh, the way fish get infected and then thereby humans is through biomagnification. So a small fish eats something infected with Cigatera, a bigger fish eats it, a bigger fish, a bigger fish. So that's why it can biomagnify in something like a barracuda, which is a top predator on the reef. But 
from what I have heard and from personal experience of myself not only eating these things, but from talking to people, Florida, and especially where we live, does not have the proper conditions to support ciguatera. So it cannot exist naturally in the wild here. And I think that has to do with our water quality. The Bahamas, on the other hand, is a hot zone for ciguatera because they have such clean water that's not polluted. You know, it's not heavily populated, as is South Florida. And so they're a lot more prone to it because ciguatera needs really clean water conditions to thrive, which is not Pompano Beach. I love Pompano, but we're a very overpopulated area with a lot of freshwater runoff, and I don't think ciguatera likes that. So. Not medical advice to eat them, but I'm just telling you, I know lots of people who eat them. I eat them myself, and I've never once been worried about ciguatera out here. In the Bahamas, completely different story. It's said you want to avoid any big reef fish in the Bahamas, and that includes something like a hogfish, a snapper, a grouper, not just these guys. These guys get such a bad rap. Another thing people say, aside from ciguatera, is mercury poisoning, but mercury is another thing the larger the fish, the greater the likelihood it can contain high levels of mercury because that's an older fish, a fish where biomagnification can occur and it just accumulates it throughout its lifetime. The locals in the Bahamas love barracuda. Um, they even like it more than some snapper. And you know, all the Americans who go over there are the tourists. They want their snapper, their grouper, their wahoo, but they will eat these fish up all day and uh, they know how to cook some good fish, so. I mean, you guys can see for yourselves, the meat does not look funky. It's pretty white. And there we go. So we got two sides of our barracuda. And another good thing about this fish is you get a pretty big yield. There's not a lot of waste on these guys. They don't have a huge rib cage. Um, you know, they don't have a lot of head meat. It's, it's a lot of yield for this fish. I feel like you guys haven't seen the catfish in a while. Come over here and look. Oh, there's a there's two jacks right there, too. There's actually a couple jacks. A bunch of catfish, jacks. They could feast on this now. That carcass will be gone in three minutes. Those catfish are going to make quick work of it. If you ever get blood on your fillet, like I always say, never let your freshwater or saltwater fish hit the freshwater. If you just take your knife and you kind of rub it, along that blood, it'll accumulate on your knife, and then you can just rub it off on the fillet table, and you can just repeat this. Or if you ever get guts or anything on your fish that you don't want on there, it's a lot better to just use your knife and to just get that off of there. Very important to line it up with the edge, and I always have my left hand right here trailing right behind my knife. That way I can feel what my knife is doing, and, um, you know, a lot of people, they make the mistake of they pierce through a fish's skin, and I think it's because their one hand is here and their knife is here, and they can't tell when they get through the skin. If your knife is making direct, if your hand's making direct contact with the knife and the skin at all times like this, underneath it, you can feel exactly what you're doing. Because you don't have eyeballs on that knife, so you can't exactly see what's going on in there. Tell me that does not look like a good fish. Minimal bloodline, not mushy, and right now, that barracuda smell that you've probably smelled in your lifetime, you cannot, it, it's not evident here at all. So I will see you guys in the kitchen. When I first met Brooke's family, they had this recipe where they took cast iron pans, they took smaller cast iron pans and they made basically like individual servings, but I'm gonna do it uh, in a big one because it's just me, Dennis, and Brooke tonight. And uh, they would lay oil out olive oil just like I did at the bottom of the pan. We got some branch and vine Meyer lemon olive oil. Then they would take their fish in their individual pans just like I'm about to do right here and just take one last look at that. That is a gorgeous piece of fish. So far from trash, we're gonna set our barracuda. I'm gonna try to pick the pieces that are kind of um, in the same size range. Tomato and onion. I'm just gonna sprinkle this around our pan. And this is just a really easy 
one pan dinner and behind me I got some rice peel off going. Now we take some tomatoes. Tomatoes are gonna be so delicious and they release a lot of moisture so it keeps our fish nice and moist and it keeps our dish from drying out. It just adds a lot of flavor too. Now when we season, very important that I made sure that everything is in the pan because I want to season everything together. So I'm going in with some freshly cracked pepper right now, some paprika, or if you're Eastern European like I am, paprika, because we don't say paprika, we say paprika. Some onion powder, garlic powder of course. And now you can see why I put all of our ingredients in the pan before I started seasoning the fish. So I'm not gonna do salt, since I'm a garlic fiend, I'm gonna do garlic salt, because you can't get enough garlic. So some Lari's garlic salt. People who don't say cheese belongs on fish, look away, because I'm about to piss you off real quick. It's not even Kraft Parmesan cheese, it's uh, Francesca. It's a step above Kraft. It's not a lot, it's just a little bit. It's gonna add a little bit more flavor. Italian breadcrumbs. This is just really a hodgepodge of ingredients. I'm gonna add a little bit of beer now because that beer is gonna cook and reduce with the fish and it's gonna provide a nice sweet flavor. And then halfway through cooking, I'm gonna add a little bit more of the beer so that way it reduces a little bit more. And I don't wanna pour any of our seasoning out so I'm putting it in on the edges. We're gonna go in with a little bit of lemon zest. Just sprinkle it right on top of our fish here and our tomatoes. All right, so we're out here on the Camp Chef. You guys normally see me cooking this thing. It's got a pellet grill inside and propane, but I also like to cook on the sidekick right here. You got a burner because I don't want to stink up the house too much. Oh, we got a good flame going. So that's it, simple. You could replicate this with pretty much any fish. We've tried it with yellowtail, we've tried it with grouper, we've tried it with kingfish, fresh kingfish, we've tried it with literally every fish and it always comes out amazing. I know it's not the prettiest dish, but we're gonna deglaze it a little bit right here. Get some of that deer cookout. And then we're gonna finish it off with a little butter right on top. <laughs> so like I said, I know it's not the prettiest, but I promise you, in terms of flavor, it is delicious. It's kind of like fish fajitas. You know when you go to Chili's or a Mexican restaurant and they bring you out those peppers and onions that come by your table and you're like, why did I not order the fajitas? That's what this is for me, pretty much. Just like all those flavors and that pan with the fish just gets that, like a uniform flavor. Like I heard Victor say that we used to do this in small pans and we started out with a couple and then everyone would share it and then for like the next holiday we got another one and the next holiday we got another one before you knew it we had like eight or something yeah. like that. We would cover the entire grill and then Victor one day was like, we only have one pan here, let's try a one pan recipe and it works great as well. Yep. So I'm excited to eat it. It was so popular in their family, Brooks' dad would buy grills based on if it would fit enough pans for that recipe. That's how popular it was. And then another thing was very popular with Brooks family is you always serve it with a little rice peel off. And that is it guys. So you guys see how much the tomatoes and everything shrunk. I mean, I put in like six or seven plum tomatoes in there and um, they just shrink like crazy. So look at this flake, look at this. Falls, I'm not off the bone, but it's such a tender fish. Um, it's not oily, it's not gamey whatsoever. It's good. Tastes nothing <clears throat> like the um, the smell of the skin. It's always so amazing <clears throat> when you eat a fish that like you can see with the bloodline, you know, and you eat it, mm -hmm. and there's zero difference between the pure white meat and then that bloodline. Yep, and especially something like a barracuda, which people already, like look, that is the Barracuda bloodline right there. Look at this. You notice a slight difference in taste, but still delicious. So I wanna thank you guys so much for watching, for coming and hanging out with us on a slow day of fishing, but still a beautiful day. And we, you know, we made the most of it. We got a Barracuda, fed us for dinner, and that's all that matters at the end of the day. So till that next one, 
see ya.